Douglas Egg Breakfast and Lunch Restaurant is proud to sponsor this episode of Patriot Plates. Visit us at any one of our six Valley locations, family owned and operated since 1986. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Being in the military is being a part of history. And with approximately 18 million veterans in the United States, each one has a story. I'm Major Scott Husing, United States Marine Corps, retired. I had 10 deployments and led hundreds of combat missions. My company and I fought in some of the deadliest battles in Iraq. And I was fortunate enough to share those stories and honor the men and women who fought in my book, Echo and Ramadi. But most veterans don't get that chance. Welcome to Patriot Plates. Our producers have spent countless hours on the road searching for veteran license plates and the stories behind them. These veterans have first-hand accounts of what happened in our nation's missions, battles, and wars. Patriot Plates believes that all veterans should be able to tell their story. My name is Charles G. Byers, Jr. I served in the Army and I served from 1966 to 1972. Well, I grew up in, in Houston, Texas. I played football. My father was a, a World War II veteran, and it was interesting that he didn't really talk a lot about it, and I wished he would have because I'd like to have known more. But he jumped the day after D-Day into France. So I'm thinking anything my dad could do, I could do. So. When Vietnam started raising its ugly head, I volunteered for the draft. And I knew I was gonna be drafted. But when you volunteer, you get to pick and choose what you wanna do. So I figured that I would become airborne. I would become a paratrooper. So I finished my basic training and then instead of sending me to Fort Benning, they sent me to Fort Sam. Fort Sam was like the country club of the army. I don't wanna leave. <laughs> I started volunteering for every medical course I could take. And then I got orders for Third Field Hospital in Saigon. And I go over there and they said, you're going to the 9th Infantry Division. And I said, you can't do that. I have orders for Third Field Hospital in Saigon. And they looked at me and said, you're in the Army, we could do anything we want. So there I was, I became a senior combat medic for the ninth of the tree division. I think the biggest story happened on June 1st, 1968. I had 23 days left, so I've already been in Vietnam for 11 months. So they pulled me out of the field and they had me work with a battalion surgeon. We get a phone call that our unit hit an ambush and they were, they were really hit hard and they needed extra supplies. They wanted the battalion surgeon, myself, and another medic. Well, I decided that I would definitely, I, I would go on it. But Dave Squires from Louisville, Kentucky, and he was going home in nine days. And David was kind of unique. David was a conscientious objector. 
never carried a weapon, only carried a, a buck knife to cut away clothing. He was a good medic. He came to me and said he wanted to go. He said, Dave, you can't. You're going home in nine days. You know, you've done your job here. He said, but these are my guys. I've been with them all year. I, they need me now. So I gave in and they picked us up. They dropped us down. And they don't drop you right on, you know, you have to walk. And all I knew is I heard the firing. The doctor had a 45, I had my M16. Dave had his buck knife. So I figured I'd walk point, and you don't see too many medics walking point. But they dropped us in the wrong area. They didn't drop us on our unit. They dropped us on another unit. And this was a recon unit, and they were chewed up pretty bad. They were surrounded by about 500 North Vietnamese. And then we started patching up as many guys as we could. And I was on the third, third guy, and he was shot up pretty bad. I had to give him an airway. I never done an airway, Bill Trake. I opened up his throat, and just as I put the airway in, that's when I took a hit. I got shot in the left arm and in the gut. And the first thing that kind of came to me was, wow, I'm going home. And the second thing that came to me was, wow, they're still shooting at me. So I picked up a M79 grenade launcher, sometimes referred to as the bumper, and I started firing to suppress the fire. That was about two o'clock in the afternoon, and I didn't get out to about six o'clock that night. I made sure I got everybody out. I got my guy that I put the, the trach in, got him out, got him, you know, stabilized. I gave myself two shots of morphine, so I'm feeling a whole lot of pain. And we had to call in an airstrike on top of us, and we had to move as many people as we could. Six o'clock that night, a helicopter came in and took me out. And the chopper pilot was receiving fire as, they, as I was loading into the helicopter. Thank God for that helicopter pilot. He picked me up and, and took me to a, a field hospital, lost a lot of blood and uh, I was there and stabilized. And then the next day they flew me to Japan. And it wasn't until the next day or when I got to Japan that I found out that Dave made the ultimate sacrifice. Dave gave his life for his country. It, I had a lot of survivor's guilt because I could have been maybe stronger and said, Dave, you can't go. but. That was Dave's decision and I worked through it. It was pretty bad that day, but I was able to get most of the wounded out. I was like one of the last wounded to get out. And I did that on purpose, make sure that I got, got the guys out. We can get them on the helicopter, we can get them home. Patriotism is that you fight for something that you believe in, you do your job. In Vietnam, it was a little different. We, were, we knew we were supposed to be there for stopping the spread of communism. But after a while, you were there for your brother. And I'm proud. I'm proud that I served in Vietnam. And that's maybe why I continue to serve. And when I got out, I wanted to go to nursing school, and I used the military to help me send me to nursing school. And I went to Walter Reed Army Institute of Nursing program. And believe it or not, I served on the presidential ward for six months at Walter Reed. So I took care of Martha Mitchell, Senator Richard Russell, Melvin Laird, Department of Defense. Uh, you know, I took care of some really interesting people, even Mamie Eisenhower. Someone once told me that life doesn't begin until you volunteer. So I retired from, from healthcare and I worked with uh, Chris Christie. I was on his veterans task force. I 
became the Chief Veterans Service Officer uh, here in Arizona. I was invited to um, Washington, D.C. to the signing of the Mission Act, which was a really strong program to expand the veterans' health care. And I was invited to be on the, uh, the platform when President Trump signed the, uh, the, the Mission Act. And when I was there, I uh, was also asked if I would continue to be a congressional a liaison for the VA and the military. And I figured what better way to help veterans now do it congressionally. I'm currently the, uh, the National Legislative Director for the Military Order of the Purple Heart, still fighting for veterans, fighting not just for the Vietnam vets, but the veterans of today. And then I'm also the chair of the National Chair for Veterans Health Care for the Vietnam vets. And just recently, I got appointed by Governor Ducey to head up the uh, hyperbaric oxygen program out here. And this is for veterans who suffer from TBI and PTSD. Last year, I was uh, selected to represent the Purple Heart Hall of Honor, which is in upstate New York. I, I was chosen for the honor flight and, and to be part of that and represent Arizona was, was a lifetime experience but then go to the place where George Washington actually started the Purple Heart. It was quite an honor because we had members, you know, veterans from, from all over the United States. And it wasn't just Vietnam vets, we were younger veterans. And there were women in there that received the Purple Heart. And to be amongst them, and that to me shows our, our country's patriotism and how we've shed blood. As I continue to serve, and because I, I was a, a medic, we carry a little bit of survivor's guilt because we have done something a little different. And it's hard for somebody maybe to understand except for another medic. So I started a, a new organization, and it's called National Association of Military Medics and Corn. And our mission statement is docs helping docs still serving. And we've opened it up to all military medical, not just Vietnam, not just medics and corpsmen, doctors and nurses. And we have over 180 national members right now. And I think that's gonna be my legacy as, as part, because I am the national commander for that in my spare time. My call sign was Big Band-Aid. And a lot of the guys here all know me as Big Band-Aid. So maybe that's why I continue to serve is that I still have that service being the Big Band-Aid. I, I love helping my fellow veterans as much as I can, and I'll continue to do it as long as I live. Don't miss our next veteran story on Patriot Plates. Get notified by liking and subscribing below. We want to thank our special sponsors, the Papago National Guard Base and the Arizona Military Museum under the direction of Colonel Joe Abodili, who made this episode possible. I'm retired Major Scott Husen, hoping that the next time you see a veteran plate, you'll think about the story and the sacrifice that went behind it. Thanks for watching Patriot Plates. One veteran, one story.
Save the Brave connects veterans through outreach programs to build strength of character. Our essential task is to prevent veteran suicide. Save the Brave is committed to providing veterans with post-traumatic stress ways to connect in a safe space. To donate your time, money, or resources, visit savethebrave.org. Reach out to a veteran in need and direct them to Save the Brave.